Okay, I'm Donald Lee Proctor. I go by my middle name of Lee. I was born in Tillamook uh, at my aunt's house in uh, September 26, 1939. Uh, they were, uh, Dad was a farmer at that time living with his mother. And uh, um, the thing is that nobody had any money, uh, but what they did was um, trade goods back and forth. Um, if you need chicken eggs, you gave them a chicken and this kind of thing. And uh, of course, everybody raised their own vegetables at that time, so uh, there wasn't any problem with that. My dad did indicate that a loaf of bread cost five cents at that time. But that was like a uh, hour or two wages, so uh, it was <laughs> compared to today. It, it's about the same. Oh uh, well, I won't walk to school. Probably six to eight blocks. It was called Wilson School, and uh, uh, went there a full six years, and um, walked back and forth to to school every day. The substitute teacher we had for quite a while because the main teacher was out sick or something um, did allow us to chew gum and uh, so we were used to that when our main teacher came back oh man did we get in trouble over that but uh, um, if I remember right we had a man teacher and all I forget exactly what he wanted to talk about but we didn't learn any English or any of that stuff. We had a heck of a time when our regular teacher came back and uh, tried to get back into it. Uh, Tillamook, you know, is not known for any heat or anything. Well, in the sixth grade, uh, they had us to, uh, do a choir type thing. Everybody had, uh, it was a spring program for all the kids. And in May, it got so hot, one of the kids uh, passed out in the group on the stairway and uh, instead of somebody turn around and catch the person everybody stepped out of the way and the poor kid went down three flights of stairs <laughs> but uh, it was just normal kid stuff and and uh, uh, of course uh, we had no cell phones we had no TV um, um, you had a regular line phone um, but um, there were several parties on the same line and uh, you just got a different ring for you to answer that. The problem is that somebody else was talking uh, and you couldn't get them off. It was up to them to whether they quit talking or not. And so there was a few disputes over that, but uh, uh, nobody ever had a, an individual phone line. and. Uh, uh, of course, in the early days of television, it had no picture. And so we sat around in the evening to listen to the radio all the time. And uh, to <laughs> to go from that, like Batman, Lone Ranger, and, and that kind of thing, to now seeing them on television, uh, that was quite a change uh, as a kid. Because uh, we had no movies, no uh, pictures, that kind of thing. Well, Frank and I was raised in a neighborhood of girls. There was probably five different girls that were about our same age, okay? And no boys. And uh, so uh, we didn't really do much baseball or any of those that kind of activities uh, with those girls around. And so it was basically the two of us against the whole neighborhood. The way we got our first dog, okay, my uh, my grandpa Kite, which was uh, my mother's mom and dad, uh, they'd been living in Newburgh. Um, her mother started having strokes, and so uh, our lot in Tillamook was big enough that they could build a house behind us on our lot, and uh, so they did that, and that was when. Uh, we were in grade school. But my grandpa had been a oh, farmer and walnut raiser and a bunch of stuff. 
um, he went out looking for the perfect dog all over the um, Pleasant Valley, South Prairie area. And uh, he finally found a good generic brown dog with a black roof in the mouth and he was going through all this stuff to find him. And sure enough, he finally picked and selected the perfect dog, okay? Well, on the way home uh, from the south end of the county, uh, the dog threw up in the car. <laughs> Grandpa couldn't handle that. So Frank and I got a brand new puppy. And uh, we had that dog for over 14 years. And, uh, but he was just a generic brown dog. One of the things we used to do when we had peanut butter sandwiches, we put uh, peanut butter on a piece of bread and then when he opened his mouth to take it, we shoved it up against the top of his mouth and the poor dog fought and fought and fought trying to get that thing off the top of his jaw. But uh, uh, good old Prouty liked gum. And uh, uh, when we'd get done with our gum, uh, we'd throw it into the fireplace. And he'd go into the fireplace to get it. And, uh, but no, that, we used to enjoy that dog. Frank and I, I don't, uh, we were just good brothers and we did everything together. And uh, like I said, it was us against the neighborhood of uh, all girls and didn't want to play with dolls all that much. We mowed lawns and I uh, uh, actually had three paper routes to earn a little bit of money. Uh, during the summer, we'd uh, go work on uh, some of the, go out to Forest Grove area and uh, work the vegetable fields and uh, picking beans and that kind of thing to earn enough money to buy clothes for school the next fall and because uh, money was that tight. But uh, at that time, uh, kids could sh work on farms to earn a little bit of money. There's a lot of things you can do on a farm uh, that doesn't require driving and all this kind of thing that uh, are pretty good little chores and you'd make some money. But that's unavailable to the kids now. So uh, there is one thing Frank and I did. Um, about two blocks away, uh, a kid came to stay with his grandmother, okay? It was Ralph. And uh, um, Frank and I didn't think Ralph had too many smarts. And uh, so <laughs> we decided to have a, a play party or picnic kind of thing. We made uh, Kool-Aid out of uh, crepe paper water. You know, that crepe paper is that colored paper. Dunk it in the water and turn it to whatever color we wanted. We named that a... Uh, some uh, um, fruit drink, you know, and then feed that to him. We never drank it ourselves. I didn't know what was in that crepe paper, but but uh, we did that to go Ralph. We had a, we called it Swamp, about a block and a half uh, back towards uh, the south from us. Uh, we were right at the edge of the city. There was a, a creek that ran into the to the uh, one of the streams that went down to the bay, but it was total brush. Okay, uh, there was no trees, just brush, um, vine maple type stuff. And uh, so he and I went down in there and we made trails through it and built a fort down in there and whatever. Uh, of course, mom kept telling us, You gotta stay away from there, you know, you're gonna get in trouble. Well, sure enough, that's where we go and when we got away, so. Uh, they had built a brand new high school, and so they included the eighth grade in the high school. And uh, so there was five years of kids going to, to high school. So junior high only had the seventh grade. You came out of uh, uh, grade school at, after the sixth grade, seventh grade at, at they called it Liberty School, was a junior high, and then we moved into the, the uh, high school. That's right, I was the last eighth grade class. The classes was getting so big that uh, they couldn't have the eighth grade class, the five classes, so they cut it down to four. And uh, so when Frank came along, 
junior high was back to two years. My dad got a job out at Estacada, uh, actually uh, working for a, uh, they bought shares into a plywood mill. And my uh, grandfather Kai paid uh, paid a thousand dollars to with uh, uh, for my dad to get ownership share, a working ownership share in that. So we moved to Estacada. And uh, so Frank had not got into high school, and I was on my senior year. So I actually spent four years in high school and never graduated. And so moved out to Estacada my senior year, and uh, uh, that's why you met Fred. Uh, he was my buddy I met out there, and we hit it off real well. And uh, when we moved to Estacada, Frank just started his uh, freshman year in high school. We came from a dairy industry in Tillamook, where you know, the kids got up first thing in the morning, went out and milked the cows, then uh, you got breakfast and went to school. When you got done school, you got rode the bus home and milked the cows in the evening. Then you could go to the dances and the parties and that type of thing. The parties never started until eight, nine o'clock. And uh, uh, of course, being a, quite a, a church-oriented valley, um, everybody, you shut the, all the dances and parties down at midnight and everybody went home. And uh, so we moved to Estacada. It was a logging community. Both the mom and dad worked and they left at six o'clock in the morning. And uh, so the kid was free. All the kids going to school were free from six o'clock on. Uh, you waited until the bus got there about 7.38. And uh, then during the day and then at night, or in the uh, come supper time, that's when they got off work about five o'clock. Well, the husband and wife would meet up at the local tavern, and that's the socializing they would do. Well, of course, the kids were still free. So they were free from six o'clock in the morning till eight o'clock at night. And can you imagine the trouble they can get into? Five guys on the starting football lineup were seeing her parole officer every Thursday night. They'd actually attempted to rob a cream front, and this is when they were sophomores. <laughs> and so that was the environment Frank and I moved into. And uh, from the real crazy dairy farm, uh, you know, work type thing from Tillamook, it was a whole different atmosphere. Uh, Dad and Mom and Frank moved back to Tillamook. I had actually graduated and started at Oregon State College, Oregon State University. And uh, it's Oregon State College then, became university by the time I finally got my degree. But, uh, so I stayed out there and Frank and, and the family moved back to Tillamook. And uh, Frank had decided when he was 10 years old to become a minister. Guess what? <laughs> he actually ended up with his doctor's degree in divinity and uh, uh, was a minister the whole time. So, uh, But anyway, uh, uh, I then uh, went to college and uh, took two years of engineering. At that time, the big deal was you became an engineer, you got the best jobs, okay? When I started at Oregon State, the top 10% of the class was getting jobs real easy. And the other 80%, we had to fight for whatever jobs we got. But I found out you could not get a job with an engineering uh, firm during the summer uh, unless you was got through, had completed your junior year. Well, that was three years of going to school before you ever got a chance to work with these guys. And uh, so I decided to, well, I majored in pinochle one quarter. So uh, that doesn't really help your grades. Fact is, you know what a four hours of F in, uh, uh, oh, yeah, math, uh, 
I'd gone through uh, uh, algebra, trigonometry, what's the next one? Geometry. Uh, that's the one I finally... Uh, there's one more than that. Can't think of the name of it now. But I was a second term into that and the rest of them just moved away and left me. I couldn't keep up with them. And uh, that's when I majored in pinochle. And, uh, but four hours of F in one class really hurts your GPA. Really hurts it. And uh, so since I ran out of money and had uh, ambition about the same time, I went back to Estacada and went to work for a contractor. And uh, uh, then I got married and uh, uh, actually uh, uh, with uh, Nancy working in a bank and me doing contracting, we saved up enough money for me to go back to college. And it was kind of the thing, well, you've got this much in, why not get the rest of it? So I went back and I found out I was not the artist that they wanted in an architecture. You got to come up with brand new ideas every week or every few days. Well, I could do it maybe once every two weeks, but not like that. So that's when I decided, okay, you guys, you draw up the plan. I'll be the contractor and build them for you. And so I got back into construction and really enjoyed that. Uh, worked for a firm, firm part-time. Um, as a, a carpenter's, uh, actually got into the carpenter's union and uh, was doing carpentry work on these, they had built an apartment complex for the college. And uh, sure enough, their draftsman um, quit and left them. And they actually had me go into the office and do uh, uh, draw up house plans and, and uh, construction plans for uh, apartment complexes. So. Uh, I got to got into that and so uh, that was with my little bit of architecture was enough to get me going in that and, and so I worked for them to got me through college and uh, ended up taking another three years uh, I ended up changing from construction to I mean from uh, architecture to business with a construction minor and uh, but when the time, time to graduation, construction was down that year. And unless you was the boss's son, you couldn't get a job in construction. It was just that simple. So that's how I got into a savings loan. I had no idea what they were. But uh, they, uh, uh, savings loan invests strictly in real estate, uh, construction, home purchases, real estate, this kind of thing. And so it fit right in with everything I dig. And, and uh, so that's when I moved to Dallas and, and had fun there. Yeah, the seventh grade. Well, it was after the Tillamook burn was actually a, a series of seven burns uh, over, uh, how was it, every three years they had a minor uh, forest fire and in seven years they had a major one. Okay, and they burned off most of the coast range around Tillamook. And uh, uh, so uh, luckily the state at that time, um, forestry was a big industry in Oregon. And so they uh, um, was sponsoring all kinds of programs to replant trees. So then they were taking the seventh graders um, from junior high and uh, we'd go up uh, uh, several weekends and plant forest, uh, brand new forest trees. And uh, that was quite an experience. Uh, of all the things you want to plant, you ever figure out how to plant a tree? Anyway, we learned how to do it. Uh, you just take a shovel in the ground and pull it apart, put the tree in, and pump the dirt back. Well, this is fine on level ground. All of that where we planted it was all um, forest trains up the uh, Wilson River Highway. And uh, so uh, we did that quite a bit. And actually, uh, there's several areas when we drive through, we remember that's where we planted them. 
the trees at. And uh, so, but when I moved to Estacada, um, uh, the foresters there uh, uh, would hire uh, uh, high school students on the weekends to plant trees. And uh, you could work two days for eight hours, 16 hours over the weekend, and you'd make pretty good money. They're just now, just the last few years, started uh, to uh, 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 harvest the trees that we planted. And uh, because that was back in about 1950, so a few years ago. My grandpa Kite that lived right behind us, I really looked up to him. And uh, he <laughs> he was one of the old one of the old farmers. Number one, he did not like to see kids cry. Okay? They had to be tougher than that. And so by golly he taught me how not to cry. And I don't think I cried until I was seventy years old. And uh, uh, just he flat taught me how not to. But when they was building that house, uh, I did have a. Um, they torn down a, uh, a big chicken coop or something to where they was building the house, and of course all those boards were laying around with nails sticking out of them. I stepped on one. I didn't dare cry, right? But my grandma kite, uh, Annie, uh, I, her and I, she spotted what happened. I still had the board walking around with it uh, hanging to my foot, okay? She helped me get it off. We got that wound all cleaned up, all bandaged up and everything. And Grandpa Kite, Elmer Kite, never knew a thing about it. And uh, uh, so... He was the one I looked up to, but the the other interesting thing is, my dad, my dad and his brothers, they were seven years apart in age, so the oldest one, 14 years older than my dad. He had a, a farm out near our homestead in Pleasant Valley, and uh, Ken and Jack and Joyce, yeah, Ken's the one you met. His older brother and sister lived there. Those are the ones I looked up to, because they were out in the, we lived in town and they were out in the rural area, and we got to go up there and play around. And, and uh, Ken had actually traded a bicycle for a car that had been a dune buggy that uh, the guy couldn't get it to run anymore. So Ken traded him a bicycle for it to work. And he got this thing and he got it cleaned up and got the engine cleaned up and got it running. Well, the thing was so beat up, they stripped the whole frame off of it. So all there was was the, the uh, I mean, the, all uh, the, the uh, doors and the top and everything was the uh, body frame, and he bolted the car seats back onto that, and uh, uh, had a brace for the steering wheel, and uh, uh, of course he could ride that around their farm back up in the hills and and uh, not have to have a license or anything. And so that was a real treat for Frank and I to go out there and get to ride around in his buggy. Oh, and the way they practiced on uh, for hunting, they hung light bulbs in trees and shot them with a 22 with the wind blowing. That teaches you real quick how to be a good shot. And uh, uh, so, uh, that's the two groups I really looked up to. Oh, what I didn't explain was my dad's older brother, uh, who was 14 years older, married my mom's sister. Okay, so they were double cousins. And uh, uh, Aunt Lena was a fantastic lady. She ended up with uh, rheumatism real bad, but... Uh, uh, now they lived a, a quarter mile off the main highway, okay? And at that time they was just getting electricity into the rural area. He, 
uh, my uncle, uh, he called him Cicero at that time, worked for the power company. But since he was up a, a single house of a quarter mile road, that cost too much to run the line. They wouldn't run a line up to him. So he had the old coal lamps and um, you heated water on the stove and poured it in a big tub to take your baths in the kitchen. And uh, the ironing was done with, with those flat irons that was heated on the wood stove and uh, uh, that type of thing. Of course, in town, we had electricity. And so uh, <laughs> that was yeah, a real adventure to go out and visit them and we really look forward to it. And uh, 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 so that was, we consider that way out in the woods. Well. It's almost downtown now, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> yeah, those are the ones I was real close to. My dad's other brother, Harold, the middle one, uh, he actually uh, married a gal and she was a nurse. And it was, uh, I was born at their house. Uh, apparently I was, mom was two weeks overdue before I decided to get born and I weighed 12 pounds. And that's one reason for this uh, scrunched ear is that they claim they use forceps to get me out. And uh, that's why the ear got damaged. Meanwhile, my grandfather Proctor's older sister married an Ellis. And uh, uh, <laughs> when they moved to Tillamook, they had, uh, Julia Proctor and, and A.B. Ellis ended up having 12 kids. And each one of those kids had 12 kids. So all of a sudden, uh, the close relatives of Ellis's was a big family. And the weird part about it was when Frank and I was around, uh, it was the grandfather, uh, grandchildren of... of uh, uh, Julia that was marrying back into the uh, family. Uh, my mother's brother married a, an Ellis and uh, uh, my dad worked with Clyde and so we were around the Ellis's a whole bunch. They'd have family reunions and oh you couldn't believe it uh, how much uh, well one of them got to making his own homebrew beer and of course they'd have those at the party. And uh, uh, I think there was a few stills up in the woods that uh, contributed to some of the other drinking stuff. But they'd have the party and the dinner in the whatever dance hall they was in. And uh, then the guys would go out to the car in the trunk and get into the booze. And uh, of course as little kids, he was always impressed of, of uh, that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, we were around booze all the time, it, uh, but it was never uh, used abusively. It never got out of hand. It was just at the social events when they got together, and, and then once in a while they got off work, they each wanted to have a beer or something, and that'd be it. And uh, so we didn't consider it a drinking problem at that time, and like you see a lot of them today. And, uh, uh, but, uh, yeah, um, uh, it ended up, we had a big family in Tillamook that we'd get together with these social events, but the ones I really looked up to, of course, was my grandfather, uh, uh, Elmer Kite, living right behind us, and then, uh, uh Sister and Lena's, uh, kids, and going up visiting them. So basically, out of all the Proctor kids, uh, Frank and I and Ken, his two brother and sister are gone. Uh, Harold boy is gone. His, I don't know if his daughter is or not. But that's it out of the Proctor's family. And uh, But the Ellis's are all over the place. And I don't know how many of those I'm related to. And, uh, uh, oh, my grandmother Proctor's maiden name was Hines. 
and she came from the Forest Grove area. Well, they all lived out there. And from Tillamook to Forest Grove, that was um, <laughs> when my dad took his family over there. And they had to do it by uh, uh, horse and buggy. It took them two days to get there. Now it takes you, what, an hour and a half, two hours? But the Wilson River Highway was not built until just about World War II. He died in 1934. I was born in 39. His father, George, uh, lived, uh, he was in the Civil War. And then he moved into the middle of uh, Iowa and uh, married a gal there. And he had four girls and one boy. There were two girls, the boy, and then two more girls, okay? And his uh, wife, Mary Reese, passed away after that fifth child. And here poor George was with four girls and a boy to raise. Okay, so he ended up marrying another lady called uh, Mary Alton. And uh, they had a baby and uh, uh, all I can remember now is her, her uh, last name is McWilliams. But uh, apparently George and this lady really didn't get along all that well. So he took his, well, when he got his daughters all married off, he and his son headed for Oregon. And by that time, the trains were running. It was 1895. You couldn't uh, have a car until uh, you were 16. Uh, so normally we walked everywhere we went. Uh, but uh, we had uh, no cell phones, no, uh, uh, it, so we didn't take pictures. Uh, we didn't have the internet. So, uh, but we never worried about that. Uh, you just walked to where you wanted to go and uh, you talked to everybody face to face. And if you didn't want to talk to them, you didn't get close to them. When I was in uh, uh, high school, um, I worked at three dairy farms. And so most of the time I was uh, riding a bus to school, get up, milk cows, ride the bus to school, go back home, milk cows, then we could party if we wanted to. And I didn't have a car, so unless somebody took me, I never went a lot of times. But uh, then when uh, Sharon and I connected up when she moved to Tillamook, uh, Dad let me borrow uh, our Ford at that time. And, and uh, uh, so did a lot of dating with her. Normal, since I worked on a dairy farm, I worked Saturdays. And uh, they worked seven days a week. I And then they would let me off to go to church Sunday morning and then back at it again on the farm. And uh, uh, earned about $100 a month. And uh, they fed me, so it wasn't too bad. Didn't have to spend any money on food. We had a movie house in, in Tillamook where I forget how much it cost to go. Uh, I think it was 50 cents or somewhere in that range. And uh, um, other than the radios, uh, which we listened to all the soap operas and, and uh, Lone Ranger and Batman and all that type of stuff, but it was all radio. Uh, we had no uh, deal, so. The big thing is if that good movie came down, you went to, to the movies and totally wild what they do today. We never even imagined anything like that at the time. <laughs> Fred and I was reminiscing some of the stuff that was pulled. Uh, we actually shot a deer with 22s, totally out of season. Uh, uh, up the road, it was we was right at the edge of the timber, and up the road, somebody spotted some deer, and uh, we thought, what the heck, and went home, got our twenty twos, and went up there and killed a uh, deer with twenty twos. Okay, then we put the the deer in the back of one of the cars, 
it was getting late in the evening. Uh, so the next day, we drove the car to school with a deer in the back. One of the other classmates, his dad was a state patrolman. Well, we didn't dare go there until his dad went to work. His dad was uh, patrolling I-5, and so he was gone for quite a few hours. So then we went up to his house uh, right after school and, and, uh, uh, and gutted out the deer and, and uh, you know, de took the skin off and butchered it up and got it all ready and divided it up between four families, I believe. But it was really interesting. I got home and I went, walked into uh, my house to my dad and said, would you like to have some venison? And you just see the questions roll in his head because it was out totally out of season. I think it was like springtime with you know. And uh, I said, don't ask any questions. Would you like some venison or not? Okay. And so we had venison for a few meals, and uh, which was always good meat. We, uh, my dad was always a hunter. When I first got my driver's license and uh, my dad let me drive, sure enough, I wanted to turn around on rural roads. I backed to, into a farmer's driveway. I hit a fence and it popped, the, the, broke the lens on the tail light. So, scared to death what my dad was going to demand when I got back to town. I walked in and I knew I just had to tell him because he spotted. So I walked in and told him, and he said, well, replace it. Hmm. That was the end of that. So I had to make sure I earned the money to go buy a new lens and install it myself. He didn't do a thing. When I moved to Estacada, uh, that's when things got a little wild. And uh, unfortunately, everybody did a lot of drinking at that time. I uh, did roll a car, but I did it right down the middle of the highway. Uh, it was on the, the river road that went out east of town. I was coming back for my third party, and when I came around, a, it was a kind of a, a U-shaped corner. And uh, when I come out of that, I was going sideways, and the car just rolled up on its top, slid right down the road. And uh, uh, it was interesting watching the sparks fly by. But anyway, when it stopped moving, it wasn't too long and some of my buddies showed up and we just flipped it back up on his wheels and I drove it on into town. But I had to total it out because <coughs> the tinted windows of the thing had um, cost more than the whole car was to replace those, so they just totaled it. And uh, so after that, I got six cylinder cars. I stayed away from the eight cylinders. I was uh, driving my future wife, Nancy, back into town and about, and the, the school was, uh, there was a 90 degree, degree corner, right at the corner of the school. And I was going to turn to the right and go down to the end of the school and go into the parking lot. And about the time I got into that corner, uh, my uh, future wife told me to, no, take the other way. Uh, of course, I did that without turn signals, and sure enough, a cop was sitting on the corner watching. And uh, so he came into the school parking lot, and uh, I think I got a warning on that one. There was a story told that, that uh, um, when Fred Gaylord and I was uh, driving in town, his neighbor was a uh, county deputy, and he worked part-time for the city of Estacada, uh, filling in for the, the only city police officer they had. And uh, we spotted him doing his route one day, and we decided to follow him, find out where he went, what he did on his route. Well, we went several blocks, no big deal. We came back from him and and uh, not creating any problem. And, and all of a sudden he disappeared in front of us. I don't know if we were talking or something. 
two seconds later, he was behind us with his red lights going. And when he walked up to the side, he recognized Fred right off the bat. What are you guys doing? We want to see what you're doing on your own. Fred, go home. Get out of here. We didn't even have a warning or anything. He just ran us out of town. And so we learned that that was not a good idea to do that any further. But uh, really, I didn't uh, <clears throat> have uh, problems with the police that much. My brother indicated that I was a little headstrong and apparently I gave my mother a hard time. And uh, when I decided to do something, I did it. And uh, uh, several times she didn't quite agree with what I did or when I got home or this type thing. So that would be the only advice I would say is uh, listen to your mother, find out how mad she was because uh, uh, when anybody got mad I considered that their problem not mine that's why I didn't worry about it and uh, so consequently I don't think I recognize a lot of times when I should have taken different actions and uh, uh, there may have been some people that disliked me over that but uh, they didn't tell me to my face, so I didn't worry about it. I was a college class, attending a college class at Oregon State University when we got the word that JFK was, had been shot. Uh, and uh, <laughs> it was about 11 o'clock in the morning in Corvallis. So we were let out of that, as soon as we got the word in the class, we were let out of the class and we all went home to watch it on television. Well, I had some afternoon survey classes and uh, we thought we'd check in and the guy would cancel it. And no, we had to go through the whole survey class. And uh, uh, so we didn't really get to watch much of it until uh, after we got out of our college classes. But uh, that was a real shock to the whole nation because everybody liked uh, uh, John Kennedy, really did. Uh, he was coming up with new ideas and he started the, the space race and, and um, all of that type stuff. So the young people were uh, enjoyed him, okay? And, uh, but we got to watch television and hear the whole story about uh, Apparently this guy acted on his own and did the shooting from uh, a hotel overlooking the route that he went on. And, and uh, <clears throat> then uh, when he was caught and hauled into to prison, uh, we got to see the movies of, of uh, when the uh, assassin shot him. And so he never went to trial and because uh, he was killed by this assassin and uh, that screwed everything up <laughs> but that's where I was at okay uh, yeah uh, she moved to Tillamook when I was a sophomore and her and her sister I was at that time uh, my brother and I was in the youth choir for the church and so this was a Sunday we were up in the, the uh, choir loft singing for the church and uh, her and her sister walked in the back door. I saw that young lady and I said, I got to get to know her. And we hit it right off right away. But uh, so I went with her about two years. And then uh, my folks moved to Estacada and of course I had to go with them. And... Uh, Sharon went ahead and, and graduated from Tillamook and she actually got a, um, a scholarship to go to Northwest Christian College down at Eugene. Meanwhile, I went to Oregon State so we never connected up again. And uh, it was about 14 years later that I finally got divorced, smart enough uh, Nancy and I personalities just did not work and it was best that we divorced 
And uh, but I was working at a savings loan or like a banker, so I went to Tulum for my parties. And uh, uh, my mother was the secretary of the grade school. And uh, one day she turned to me and said, "Did you know Sharon's back in town?" Well, no, but uh, it actually took me six months to get the nerve up to go back and to actually go and see her. And she was working up the Wilson River in a restaurant as a cook. And uh, once we met up again, we never separated after that. And we were actually married for just under 40 years. The fire department had a, a sweetheart banquet every year. So I took her and sure enough, that's the year they decided to have the, the spouses or the females introduce the firefighter, okay? And poor Sharon was brand new in town. Then she had to get up and say something about me. <laughs> and uh, uh, but that's the way she she was immediately in, uh, uh, adopted by the fire department people. And so that was our social activity. Yeah, uh, they were a real good group. And uh, that poor girl, uh, she uh, worked for restaurants for a while and. Then it was a matter of getting those kids through high school. She was just a good hostess, a great cook. Uh, made the best meatloaf you've ever had. And uh, uh, she was just a good cook. And, and uh, uh, we were just the best couple. Uh, like I said, she was my soulmate and uh, we worked together perfect. and, and uh, it was us against the kids, you know, get them strong enough to get out on their own. And uh, so that's the best thing I can say about Sharon. My great grandfather and my grandfather, well, my great grandfather was uh, George Proctor and he'd been in the Civil War. And uh, when he got out, he was in Iowa married a gal, ended up with uh, four daughters and one son, okay? Um, then his wife died. And uh, when the girls were still in school. So he married another lady and uh, uh, eventually they really didn't get along that way well. But he got those daughters married off. And then him and his son went to Oregon. Well, the surprising thing is the oldest daughter married an Ellis. The Ellis's, they had 12 kids. And each one of those had 12 kids. Okay? Well, when George and his son John took off for Oregon, it was late enough in 1895 they rode the train out. You heard all about the wagon trains and all this kind of, they rode the train out. <laughs> and uh, uh, was in Forest Grove and, and uh, worked for a, a landowner there. And uh, the son married uh, the landowner's uh, daughter. And uh, then they, uh, the, uh, uh, the daughter's father would not sell George and John the prop uh, any land in Fort Grove area, so they heard about uh, uh, this uh, land deal in Tillamook, and uh, uh, so they went down to Tillamook in 1908 and uh, established a homestead on 160 acres, and I think they had to work it like three years, and then it was given to them, deeded over to them. So uh, that's how they got started. Well, in a, it was about 20 years later or so, uh, the oldest son uh, had a uh, sawmill and he was gonna donate the, the lumber for uh, his mom and dad to build a house. And uh, George, uh, the father, or the uh, grandfather, uh, he got in touch with his daughter that married the Ellis 
and there was two or three brothers that were all carpenters. And he talked them all to move from Iowa to Tillamook, Oregon, and uh, uh, got them to donate their labor on building the house. And uh, of course, he assured them that there was no carpenters down there. So uh, he was sure then they'd be able to get all the jobs they wanted. And they did, and they become very successful in the county. But that's how the Ellis's showed up again and, and got mixed up with the Proctors again. And then uh, uh, some of the Ellis's married uh, some of the in-laws. And, uh, uh, one of them married uh, my mother's brother and uh, uh, another uh, married Galloway and uh, his sister married uh, Harold Proctor and it just got <laughs> on and on but that was the the big thing was uh, when I finally found out that the uh, one of John's sisters married the Ellis and started that whole thing and we were actually uh, part of the Ellis family because of that marriage. Um, I was under the impression it was the grandchildren who started intermarrying that that was our connection. It wasn't. It started with the grandmother and uh, apparently as a proctor she was a pretty tough old lady. Some of them uh, had troubles getting along with her but, but uh, by God, you got them all raised. Just be the best you can be. And <laughs> try to get a job of what you really want to do. Not necessarily what everybody thinks you ought to do. And uh, be true to yourself. And uh, keep in touch with all your relatives. And that's the message I'd like to leave with them. Be true to yourself and really work to get the job you want to do. And that way you can enjoy it. No, I just wanted to be sure my grandkids keep in touch with me and, and uh, we get to meet up once in a while and I get to become familiar with the grand, great-grandchildren. And uh, uh, the thing I'm discovering is they're all total different personalities. And so it's going to be a learning curve on my part to, to know how to deal with each one. But uh, I'd like as, as many as the great-grandchildren to get to know me um, before my time's up. Family. I was real happy that it turned out the way it did. Uh, I, my first wife, Nancy, we had two kids and mutually agreed to, to uh, uh, divorce. And uh, so that was just a matter of signing papers and having it filed at the county and uh, we were divorced. And then I got together with Sharon again, which was my love from high school. We both ended up getting divorced about the same time. Well, she had four kids and I had two. And uh, Dan, my son, came to live with us. So we ended up having four boys in the house. And uh, then Kelly, the, the little girl, they ended up with 75 roses. But I'm pretty proud of the family that has been developed out of that whole thing. I think it turned out some real good uh, kids, grandkids, great-grandkids. And I'm enjoying um, being the grandfather and getting to see them all and see my great-grandkids right now. My stint in the fire department. Uh, I worked up to battalion chief in 37 years. Um, I've gone into burning buildings. Uh, um, there's been incidents with deaths involved uh, and uh, 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 one of the things I really uh, developed and, and got into was um, 
uh, tanker shuttles for rural fires. When you got a rural fire, you don't have a hydrant there. So you need to, to uh, shuttle your water with tankers. And so we set up drop tanks, set up a pumper to pump to the scene. And uh, uh, one of those that we had water within a half a mile and uh, we were able to maintain over a thousand gallons of water a minute and uh, was able to put out that structure fire real quickly. But uh, I was uh, fortunate they would keep naming me. Uh, I wouldn't be able to make the first truck in. So when I arrived, uh, that's when they had me set up as a water supply officer. And I really enjoyed that. We did that for a lot of years. And uh, so what was interesting is when I retired, and of course they uh, had a big party and uh, they, a couple of guys got up and stayed and talked about me and everything. But the biggest thing that, that was said that I remember is Lee Proctor trained us all. And I felt real proud of that, that uh, that's the way I was being considered. That's uh, my history and, and uh, what I'm trying to accomplish and uh, a little bit about the family and hope the kids enjoy it.